Okay, another pre-Socratic to talk about is a guy named Pythagoras. And as soon as you saw Pythagoras' name, or I said Pythagoras, at least 93% of you said, I've heard of that guy before. And a heartbeat later, later you said, the Pythagorean theorem. And you're right. Pythagoras is the guy who comes up with the Pythagorean theorem. This ring any bells? A squared plus B squared equals C squared. Everybody remembers that. I think I remember the square of the hypotenuse is equal to the sum of the squares of the other two sides. I think I got that right after all these years. I think I got that right. That's the Pythagorean theorem. That's what you learned in algebra class or maybe even before then. It's a way to tell the length of the hypotenuse or the, all the sides. You t tell all this. You can figure out all the, if you know two of the sides, then you can figure out the third side of a right triangle. That's a triangle with a 90 degree angle down here. I don't know what your experience has been, but um, I did not think I would ever use this when I learned it in high school, but um, I use it quite often. I wouldn't say every day, but uh, it's pretty handy. It has come in handy an awful lot of times for me to figure out the distance between something when I can imagine a right triangle there. Well, uh, to review the Pythagorean theorem um, for you, um, here's an easy one, the 3, 4, 5. This is probably what your teacher taught you with, right? Let's do a quick review. The square of 3 is what? 9. The square of 4 is what? 16. 16 plus 9 is what? 25, and the square root of 25 is what? 5. You see how the numbers line up every time you do this with the right triangle. So far, so good. That's simple enough. But then Pythagoras, Pythagoras used his theorem to discover something that surprised him and surprised everybody. What happens if you have a right triangle with a side of 1 and a second side of 1? Well, what's the square of 1? 1. What's the square of 1? One? 1. That means that the um, hypotenuse, the length of the hypotenuse, is the square root of 2. Now, what's the square root of 2? You might have had to learn these things. Um, 1.414, I think. You can look it up and let me know if I'm wrong. But this was what shocked everybody, because until Pythagoras had done this, everybody thought of numbers in this way. They thought numbers were... 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and so on. Sometimes you had things in between numbers, like 1 half, but that'd be 1 half of a half, or, I mean 1 half of a 1, right? Or um, you might say 1 fourth of 8, but that's 2. But what's the square root of 2? It's not a fraction. There must be numbers in between what everybody up to that time thought of as real numbers, whole numbers, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and fractions, there must be other numbers in there that we don't know about. And that kind of freaked Pythagoras and, well, I keep saying everybody, obviously not everybody, but everybody who cared about this thing. And this led him to conclude something very important. And that for Pythagoras, the Arche, Remember, that means the origin, the source, the substance of what the universe is made out of, or the beginning, for Pythagoras is numbers. Up to now, everybody has seen the Arche as something in the physical universe. Water, air, fire, and so on. Pythagoras saw the Arche as something not within the physical universe, that the substance of the universe is not physical but instead are numbers, and especially these kind of secret, hidden numbers. You remember this diagram, and we've worked through it um, already once, at least once so far. A diagram of Greek religion with the people down in this physical universe you and I live in, the physical universe you and I can feel with our, with our bodies, the um, gods up above the people. But remember I told you that the gods aren't so important in Greek religion. But instead, what's really important is the theos thing, the rules or pattern of the universe, the logos thing, thought or word, and that everybody has inside their head a little piece of that divine, sacred logos thing. Well, for Pythagoras, the best way to experience the theos thing is to study mathematics, to do the geometry homework 
until your mind breaks through in a way and sees the theos thing. This emphasis on numbers for um, Pythagoras leads us to another thing to note. Just as with Thales, I said that we were talking primarily about a chemist, someone, or the, all the materialists, or our chemists, thinking about what the physical universe is made of. If we wanted to find a modern science for Pythagoras, let's go with physics. Some of you have taken a physics course, and if you take a physics course, you know that you have to study a lot of math, because that's what physics is, the application of math to the physical universe reducing the physical universe down to numbers, and then studying the relationship between between those numbers. That's what physics is. You know, if you take a physics course, you know you have to have at least college algebra first, because you're going to be working with a whole bunch of numbers. And as often happens with people who become consumed with numbers, this leads to a sense of mysticism, a sense of trying to uh, discover something outside this physical universe, like numbers, right? Art and numerology, which is a type of mysticism, of seeing mystical, um, spiritual uh, meaning to numbers. I don't know how much of what I say from now on belongs just to Pythagoras or to his followers. We don't really know because we don't have any works from Pythagoras, no complete works. We have some fragments like we do for these other pre-Socratics. But uh, either Pythagoras or his followers very early saw some, some numerical mysticism in numbers. They ascribed, um, the, or they rather they discovered that there are even numbers and odd numbers. That means there are different kinds of numbers. The first even number they call a woman. The first odd, that's number two. The first um, odd number they identify with men. Okay. And then they begin to work from there to see how these, um, these things work out. For example, number five. Five is two plus three, right? Even and odd, male and female, and so that comes to reckon, to, to uh, resemble or to uh, symbolize, that's the word I want, symbolize, union, when two things come together that are different, justice, when you have two people who disagree, who come together and find the meeting of the minds, or are given the meeting of the minds by a court or something, balance, where you have even and odd together, man and woman together, the number seven comes to mean something that's fully developed. By the seventh month, a child can be born who's premature and yet be developed enough to survive, even in those days. Um, uh, uh, babies come out at seven, come from a woman, two. Two times seven is 14. When a child becomes 14, then they're developed. They reach puberty and they are, they are developed. And so it's kind of this weird, mystical, numerology kind of stuff. And again, I'm not sure Pythagoras comes up with this, but that's what he... Eventually, and again, I'm not sure how much Pythagoras comes up with this, this mysticism becomes a cult with some odd rules, like the um, avoidance of beans. You can't eat beans. Um, when you take your shoes off, you have to take your white, right shoe off first. Uh, when you wash your feet, you have to wash your left foot first. Um, these strange rules, uh, I'm not quite sure what they mean, but that's how you make a cult, right? You come up with strange rules, then everybody has to follow them, and then um, then they belong, right? Because everybody's following the same kind of weird, uh, uh, odd little rules. Um, and then a number of myths develop about Pythagoras, and I, I, I'm sure he didn't come up with any of these. Um, um, amongst this cult, Pythagoras had a had a golden leg um, that he could buy, locate that he could be in two physical places at once. Uh, oh, what else? That he um, could talk to bears. I don't know about this stuff. Um, anyway, the the story of Pythagoras, or rather the Pythagoreans, let's say the Pythagoreans, becomes stranger and stranger and stranger. And uh, if you go to YouTube and start looking at videos about Pythagoras, they start off with the crazy stuff about avoiding beans and all that kind of stuff. Um, but I want you to take Pythagoras seriously. Um, he's, he's the first to see, um, well, the, in a mathematical sense, he's important in discovering what are called irrational numbers. Don't worry about that. But numbers that aren't whole numbers or fractions. But uh, seeing the world as, as the, being, being uh, founded, the arche of the world being something non-physical, 
is a very interesting and, as we'll see, an important development.